Hi, everybody. My name is Hafa Lombardino, and this is Translation Confessional. Lifelong learning. Just the other day, I was talking to a friend about our kid's education. She has an 80-year-old who's my son's best friend. Since we're in the middle of a pandemic, our kids had to do distance learning at the end of the 2019-2020 school year, from mid-March through June. When the 2020-2021 school year was about to start, there was a lot of debate on how the local schools should adapt to deal with the ongoing COVID-19 threat. At first, The school district was planning on offering either back-to-school full-time or distance learning. The latter option would disassociate the students from their regular school. They would be part of a distance learning school district within the local school district and consequently be schoolless, so to speak. After some pressure, the hybrid model was offered instead of the full-time on-campus return to school. That means our kids started the 2020-2021 school year as remote students in late August and transitioned to the hybrid mode on September 28, doing some of the work remotely on the iPads provided by the school and meeting in class with their teacher only half day while being separated in two cohorts, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. That way, the number of students per classroom would be cut in half and social distancing was made possible. This hybrid learning method is pushing some parents to help their kids with independent study so they can be more responsible and take ownership of their learning. My friend and I talked about how it's hard for kids nowadays to keep notes and study something because they're used to being consumers of information whether in class or while using the online tools available to them. Well, we could say that was true back when we were students in the 80s and 90s, but the way students have access to information nowadays would allow them to be more effective and well-rounded learners. While talking about all these changes with my friend and reflecting about our own school experiences, I realized that all my life going to school in Brazil That was kind of what we did up to fourth grade. Well, we still had a crowded classroom, but we did have two cohorts. Some parents wanted to take their kids to school in the morning, while others preferred the afternoon. I was always a morning school student, which is perfect, because I've always been a morning person. It was only from fifth grade on that all students had to come in the morning because middle school and high school classes were not available in the afternoon. Still, because I went to technical high school to earn an associate's degree in computer sciences, I had some technical classes in the afternoon to complement the regular high school curriculum, besides having to meet a certain number of internship hours working as an IT person in order to get a diploma. Once in college, Brazilians have the option of completing a couple of years of their higher education studies, either in the morning or at night. In college, I took night classes to earn my bachelor's degree in journalism because I was working mornings and afternoons, teaching English as a second language, or acting as an IT intern at my university's Center for Socioeconomic Studies, while completing some translation jobs here and there. So, reflecting on my academic experience through elementary, middle, and high school got me thinking. I've always been a nerd and loved learning new things. I did struggle with math, chemistry, physics, accounting, and statistics classes, but thrived in Portuguese, English, social studies, geography, history, biology, and health. In high school, I had a hard time with programming classes, since it was just as mind-boggling as math to me. But I was lucky enough to be studying computers at the same time Windows 95 was released, which meant that programming got a little more graphic, 
and I could understand it way better once it was done visually as opposed to coding only. But why am I talking about all that and how does it relate to translation? I'll tell you more about it right after this. Have you ever thought about adding voiceover to your portfolio of services? Has a client ever asked you to perform a voiceover? Or maybe you'd just like to increase your confidence and explore your creative side. If you want to learn how to make the most of your voice, then our course, An Introduction to Voiceover for Translators and Interpreters, might be exactly what you are looking for. You'll learn how to set up a home recording studio, including how to select the right microphone, how to record professionally, editing basics, how to produce a demo, how to get your first VO clients, and more. It's an interactive course with several assignments where you'll actually record your own voice in any language and submit the audio for feedback. It also includes over six hours of video content, access to monthly group coaching sessions, and extensive resources files to help you learn even more. So, if you'd like to learn how to make money with your voice, then what are you waiting for? Head on over to training.pros.com, sign up today, and I'll see you there. That's training.pros.com. I remember being praised by classmates and teachers alike on how I kept notes, starting back in fifth grade. As a stay-at-home mom, my mother helped me learn how to study for tests up until fourth grade. Then I was on my own as she started helping my younger brother. I remember being anxious about an upcoming history test in fifth grade and focusing on the main message in the units we'd be tested on, highlighting pages and pages from our book, and then rewriting those subjects in my own words while taking notes on my notebook and simulating the questions that the teacher could end up asking us to answer. In high school, I remember this boy kind of making fun of me because my notebook was too pretty, since I took notes using two pens of different color because I've always been a visual learner and wanted to highlight some of the things I wanted to keep in mind once testing season would start. Look at how nice and clean her notebook is, he said. My notebook doesn't even have a cover anymore and I can barely find one pen every day before coming to school. <laughs> I took those note-taking strategies with me when I went to college, and it really helped me, since some classes didn't even have a textbook associated with the subject, and teachers would talk and talk and talk for about 45 minutes, and we as students would have to decide what was important to keep in mind for an exam. So I can say that this kind of anxiety, this FOMO, fear of missing out on something important that would end up being on a test is what actually triggered my studying a given topic to learn more about something I'm interested in. This is what has actually benefited me in over two decades as a translator because I enjoy researching different topics, learning new things, and compiling information. I don't use notebooks anymore but I do add comments to a text file, especially when working directly with an author so we can write their book in a different language as a collaborative experience. And for most of my technical work, I use a CAD tool to keep track of the way I translate something so I'll remember it for years to come. And I also compile preferred terminology in my glossary. That way, I don't have to research the same thing several times or refer back to a client's own glossary or instruction sent by email. The term I need to use is right there within the CAT2 environment, ready to fit a given context. I'm happy to report that in these 10 years teaching tools and technology in translation, I have never had a student say that learning different things every day was something that discouraged them from becoming a professional translator or interpreter. I guess we language people, are naturally curious, and it's great to hear from students and peers alike about their learning experiences too. 
However, there's a limit between being eager to learn new things and meddling with subjects that you know very little about. For example, there are several fields that I will not go into as a translator simply because I know I'm not the best person to work on that kind of material. And from a very pragmatic perspective, it would take me way too much time to research the topic and be able to offer a final translation that is of good quality and fits the original register. And of course, time is money. I'd rather invest my time into things I can accomplish effectively and efficiently and then assign everything else to colleagues who can do a way better job than I ever could. I've already talked about it in Episode 7, Abilities and Limitations, and I truly believe that even though we can always learn more about different subjects in our fields of specialization, there always comes a time when you must understand what your limitations are as a professional, so as to not overstep ethical boundaries. So, yes, I am an advocate for lifelong learning, and I do learn new things every day while doing my job. But I'm also an advocate for matching the right people with the right projects, which is something that not only is part of our client education efforts, but should always be a reminder for translators and interpreters on our role as agents of communication and as students as well when it comes to seeking knowledge from trusted sources in our efforts to continuously improve ourselves. Send me an email at rlombardino at wordawareness.com or leave a voice message on my anchor page. If I get enough feedback and voice messages, I can go back to the subject and post a special podcast episode with everyone's opinion on this very same theme. By the way, my anchor page is anchor.fm slash translation dash confessional. I look forward to hearing from you. Stay tuned for weekly episodes and subscribe to Translation Confessional through your favorite podcast app.